Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. For those of you who were not here yesterday, this is our Missions and Evangelism uh, Lectureship Week, where we take the, uh, the whole week of chapels to devote to the challenge and the opportunities and the ministries of evangelism and missions around our world. Uh, This year's Mission and Evangelism Lecture speaker is Pastor Mark Job, who serves as the head pastor of the New Life Community Church in Chicago, Illinois. His series title is Dangerous, People on Mission with God. Pastor Job spent the first years of his life in South America and then in Europe, where his parents were involved in pioneering missions work. After receiving his undergrad degree from Columbia International University, he went on to complete his master's at the Moody Graduate School. He's currently working on his doctorate. Since 1986, Mark has been involved in the ministry in Chicago and under his leadership, a New Life Community Church has grown from a handful of people to a dynamic, diverse, multi-site church in the city of Chicago. He has been a contributing author to various periodicals and magazines. He's a frequent conference speaker with a passion to see this generation awaken spiritually. Pastor Mark and his wife, Dee, have three children and view themselves, obviously, as a team ministry. Uh, he has consulted with uh, other schools with regard, to our, uh, with regard to urban missions and urban ministries, and we've asked him today to take a, a lunchtime, and if you were here early enough, you saw it on the scroll, uh, that we have a deep desire to, uh, to raise the bar and to, uh, to take new initiatives in reaching our cities. And so uh, that lunch is going to be very profitable, I know, for those uh, who attend. Uh, would you join me in welcoming uh, Pastor Mark Job to our platform at DTS? Thank you. It's great to be here. And boy, this weather is incredible. <laughs> we want to take some back to Chicago. About a year ago, I was speaking in San Diego, and I had decided to take my uh, wife with me, and uh, we were traveling with another couple, and the fellow that I was with, he had never been down to Mexico, and so we were only about 30 miles away from the Mexican border, and he said, can we go? I really want to go. So I said, let's make arrangement. Uh, Three of us couple got in this vehicle. When we went to rent a car, the car rental agent said, I just have to warn you, Tijuana, Mexico is just a kind of a dangerous place. In fact, we had some, uh, a couple two weeks ago that went down, they, they were stopped by the police, asked to get out of their vehicle, and the police got in and took off with their car. So be careful. So we drove uh, into Mexico, drove uh, through Tijuana, had a little lunch there, And on our way back, someone in the car, we were joking about, watch out for the police, they may stop you. Uh, As we were uh, going through Tijuana, one of the persons said to me, hey, there's a policeman behind you on a motorcycle with his lights on, and I was, yeah, right. And I looked in the rearview mirror, and sure enough, there was a guy. So I pulled lanes over just to see if he was going to pull over as well. He followed me right over and motioned me to get over and stop. So I stopped beside the side of the road. By this time, everybody in the car is panicking. One of the persons telling me, don't listen to bad counsel. One of the person was telling me, just take off, take off. <laughs> we pull over to the side of the road. A fella gets off his motorcycle, dark sunglasses, uh, has one of these uh, chip looks on him. Uh, revolver right there, speaks to me in Spanish and said, it's too dangerous here, pull up into that street over there. Sure enough, everybody in the car knew it for sure, pull off in the street, take us. So I pulled over in the street, I kept my foot on the gas pedal, room, room, room. He parked beside me, came over to me. I said, why did you stop me? He said, I was speeding and turned uh, uh, turn signals without putting my turn signal on into another lane. Said, I don't remember that, officer. And you know when someone's trying to, you feel like they want to bribe? He was saying, well, I think I'm going to have to take you down to headquarters. Uh, not I said, can't you just write me a ticket? No, no, I'm going to have to take you down there unless there's something else we can do. (laughs) 
About that time, he said, and by the way, what were you doing in San Diego? I said, well, I'm a pastor. I happened to go there. He looked at me, still his sunglasses on. Here I am in Tijuana, Mexico. This guy's trying to bribe me, looks at me, and in, he's speaking to me in Spanish, says to me, what does Romans chapter 13 say? Well, I had a couple things that went through my mind. Number one, what in the world does Romans 13 say? I... And the second thing that went through, this is not like a wana. I mean, I don't get a little sticker. I may, I may get thrown in jail if I don't answer this one. I mean, I'm on the hot spot here. And so I'm stalling a little bit, and I'm saying, well, Romans 12 says, do not be conformed to this world, be transformed. And then it struck me, the beginning of Romans 13 says, submit yourself to the governing authorities as though they were servants of God. And here I am in Tijuana, Mexico, this cop is bribing me, asking me Bible verses, and it just so happened that I have a lot to do with the police department in Chicago and minister to a lot of police because my brother-in-law was a Chicago policeman that was shot and killed about seven years ago, have a real big burden for these police officers, got to tell him a little bit of that story, and he got in his motorcycle, pulled up beside me, he said, Pastor Tell your congregation, pray for the Tijuana Police Department. And then he drove off. And here's what I know. I know that God has a story that he is telling. And that way before we go somewhere, God is already at work. And every time we travel anywhere, God is connecting the pieces and God has been there way before we ever got there, even in the places that we would consider the most godless places on the face of this earth. By the way, in Tijuana, they, they had taken away all their guns, literally, this is true, and given them slingshots, true. They were checking their ballistics. It was, there was so much drug uh, problem in that place. And no matter where you go, no matter how deep and dark it may seem, no matter how grievous a place may look from the outside, the truth is that God has already been there, that God has already been at work, and that we are not doing something, we are not taking God there because God has already been there. Now that may seem like really simple, basic theology, but I believe it's theology that has to color the way that we go about world evangelization. Uh, this is an evangelism and, and missions uh, lecturnship. By the way, I told my kids I was going to go give lectures, and they looked at me like, Dad, to them a lecture is a long, boring speech. It's not a good thing. And um, so I, I said, well, I'm going to teach. Okay, all right, all right, Dad. Um, but here's the thing. I oftentimes encounter among zealous, mission-minded individuals of which I was right at the forefront in the beginning, my early days, this idea that somehow we are bringing for the very first time to a city, to a neighborhood, to a people, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and this is their first exposure to God, and that somehow, almost like the colonialism of Columbus, who I grew up in Spain, knew all about it. We celebrated Columbus Day in a big way. But Columbus brought to the Americas, first of all, it was said he discovered the Americas, which is hard for me to understand when there was whole populations living in the Americas, how you could be discovered. Uh, our Western view says we discovered the Americas, and he brought the Spanish imperial flag along with, quote-unquote, Christianity to this pagan dark world. But he brought sort of his brand of Christianity and did a lot of atrocity there. But the idea in those days was that God, for the very first time, was coming to these pagan territories and there had been no concept of God and no exposure to God and that for the very first time, as they brought their brand of Christianity to this place, suddenly people were being exposed to God. I want to talk to you this morning about the approach. Yesterday I talked to you about the call, 
And as you begin to discover your call, which every call that we have involves evangelism, ultimately our call is to glorify Christ. And the greatest way that we glorify Christ is by making disciples of Jesus Christ who come under the lordship of Jesus Christ and begin to live their lives according to kingdom standards. And that's why evangelism is one of the greatest ways of worship in our entire life because ultimately we're giving the greatest glory to Christ. Right now, if you go to Chicago, and I'm going to backpedal into my story a little bit because I want you to understand the bigger picture and some of the things that I've learned probably the hard way over 20 years of ministry in the great city of Chicago. Right now, if you go to Chicago, uh, you would find the church that I'm a part of is a little bit different than the standard church there because over the years, we've evolved into something and some people come to our church and we get calls pretty much every week or emails from some pastor or, or ministers around the nation that have heard of what we're doing and ask us, what was your master plan? And uh, I always have to let them know, hey, we had no master plan and we sort of stumbled into this, but there are some principles that we have followed that, help, that have helped us get to where we are in this place. And uh, if you go to Chicago... Uh, people ask me, where, where is the church that you're a part of? And uh, we're a multi-campus church, which means that we meet in 14 different campuses in and around Chicago. So on Sunday morning, there are 14 different campuses there. They're all one church. We do the same message at all those campuses. There's 18 pastors that uh, on, mon on Monday morning, we have a great time studying the Bible together, and uh, we actually preach the same message at those campuses. And uh, we have 26 worship services that happen at those 14 campuses because there's multiple services. And we've opted not to go through for the whole mega roof approach, bringing everybody under one big building and uh, commuting from far to get there. Our approach has been more, let's start life-giving communities of faith nestled in communities all over Chicago that speak the language of that community, that reflect the culture of that community, and try to bring transformation to that place. When we get to all together, it's a pretty big party, and there's a lot of diversity there. We're in Lincoln Park community, uh, two blocks north of DePaul University, which is a gentrified, sort of yuppie community, the average house price there is $1.5 million, and we're right in that community. And if you travel a little bit further west, we're also in the West Humboldt Park community, one of the most uh, gang-ridden, drug-ridden, prostitution-ridden areas of the city of Chicago. And um, if you travel a little bit further south, there's a Mexican migrant community in which we do an English service and a Spanish service as well. Now, there is one pastoral team that oversees this, a church that is distributed, and uh, uh, we, in the last uh, year, have planted uh, five new campuses. So it's happening at a rapid rate, but the whole, the whole ministry as we have developed it has come out of a few principles that we learned early on and have followed these principles. I guess to capture the heart of these principles, Acts chapter 17, there's a story of the Apostle Paul who is actually visiting a city, the city of Athens. And this city is a very unreached city. By the way, I said yesterday, I believe really that the key to evangelize the world of tomorrow will be found in the mega cities of the world. There are 360 cities in the world with, that have a million or more people in them. 60 of those cities are in China itself. And uh, half of the population of this world now lives in urban centers. And I believe unless we know how to reach urban centers, we will not be able to reach the world. We need those urban centers are, they're international, they're diverse, they're multi-ethnic, they're social economically diverse, they're globalized, and unless we learn how to do ministry in that kind of setting, we will not reach the, the, mil the billions of people that still need to be reached for Christ. 
I'm passionate about figuring out how do we reach cities for God. And the Apostle Paul is going to a place Athens. I visited Athens. I've been close to where the Apostle Paul spoke to uh, the people, and he was fascinated with this city. It was a pagan city, and uh, he, it tells us that he, uh, as he began to speak to the people there, they uh, heard that he was preaching a message that they had not quite understood. And I think in these explanations, his uh, his preaching of the gospel to them, we find a little bit of his philosophy in trying to reach these people. Listen to what he says. Paul then stood up in the meeting, verse 22 of Acts chapter 17. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For I have walked around and looked carefully at the objects of worship. I've even found an altar with an inscription to the unknown God. Now, what you worship as something unknown, I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world, everything that's in it is the Lord's, the the Lord of heaven and earth, and does not live in temples built by hands. And he is not served by human hands, as if he needed anything, because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. For in one man, he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the times set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not very far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring." Now, here's the Apostle Paul going to a culture that is foreign to him, a city, trying to figure out how to reach this city. And as he begins to give his apologetic message to try to get to the hearts of these individuals, we see a bit of the approach that Paul has towards the city. And the first thing that I want you to note from this is that Paul acknowledges that God has been there already. He he sees that they are religious. And he sees this statue of the unknown God. And what Paul says, and what Paul understands and knows, is that God has already been in this place, even though it may be pagan, even though it may have a, a dark worship side to it, that God has already been here, that God has already been at work that God has already been manifesting himself through creation, connecting people and connecting the message. And although the image of God is distorted, God has already been a part of their story because God God is the God of the big story. And their story, if you trace it far back, their story connects all the way back to Genesis, of course and all the way back to the knowledge of God. I was recently in in China, and uh, Dr. Tong, who's written a book called The Faith of Our Fathers, has this really interesting uh, write and exposition about the the language, the the Chinese emblems there, language, and he looks at that as a pictorial language, the images, and basically draws conclusions that this language is so old, 1,500 years old, and that these pictorial images have traces of Genesis in them. They have traces of the Mosaic, Abrahamic God that we worship way back then. See, we're all connected one way or uh, another to this big story that God is creating, And as we begin to look at the world that God has called us to, as we engage in our call and we look at our mission field, we have to go with the understanding that God has already been here, that God has already been working, that God wants to reach those people more than you and I would ever want to reach them, that God has a strategy and a plan that he's been stacking the deck for hundreds of years, seeking to put things in place for the divine connections that are coming this way. My parents were church planning missionaries, and they 
I left the U.S. when I was six months old, and they left to Costa Rica. Then they went to Chile. My father rode horseback uh, to the hills of Chile uh, to teach Bible studies in little huts that were dirt floors and had no running water. And he taught there, evangelized. This was in the late 60s. The gospel was exploding in Chile, and so they decided, we want to go to a more unreached area in the Spanish-speaking world. The last frontier of the Spanish-speaking world was the country and is the country of Spain. Forty million people. At the time in 1970, they did some research and found out that there were two cities, over 100,000 people in Spain, that had no evangelical Protestant type church and work at all. 100,000 people and no evangelical church. And there were reasons that they didn't have evangelical church in those cities, because they were tough cities. Burgos is where we landed. It's full of priests and military. Is where Franco went to vacation. It was a tough city. Uh, our windows were broken. My father was taken into the secret police often to be interrogated. Uh, people were kicked out of their house. They tried to burn, out, burn down our door. We lived in a little village, and the priest in the village basically said, do not associate with those kids that are part, those American kids that are in a sect. And so there was that sort of opposition. It wasn't blatant persecution, but there was opposition. And God did an incredible work. Franco passed away. The country exploded in openness. Literally hundreds and hundreds of young people came to Christ. Years later, I would found, found out that in about 1969, 1970, two people passed through Burgos with a new movement that had been started called OM, Operation Mobilization. George Verwer was one of those. And he passed through the city of Burgos handing out tracts, and he said that him and his partner were so overwhelmed with the fact that a city of this size had no church that they decided to pray. And they said, oh, God, would you bring a church to this place? Oh, God, bring someone to be able to tell these people about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I didn't find out till years later that two years before we went with the family of missionaries that someone had prayed there because Hey, God had already been there. And now that church there, this city of Burgos is a thousand years old. And I was just there working with some believers there that are building the first freestanding sort of evangelical church in its 1,000 year history. God has already been there, God has already been at work. As I came to Chicago and began to approach Chicago, I didn't really always understand and realize that God has a much bigger story, that he goes way far back, that even in the darkest of places, even in the most uh, serious crime-ridden areas, even in the most pagan of societies, God has been there already and has been working, and I don't bring God there, he's already there. And so if I know that God has been there, and I know that God has already been working, then part of what I need to do is I need to begin to look at what God has been doing. I need to begin to find what has God been doing and where are the evidences of God at work in this place. The Apostle Paul mentions it that way. There's an unknown God here, and he basically says to them, I'm going to tell you, you have a God conscious. You're religious. There's a statue to an unknown God. There's a God consciousness that you have. God has already been reaching out to your heart, and I'm going to talk to you about this God that you don't know. I also want you to understand that not only has God already been there, but God has already been deeply working in that area. The Apostle Paul, as he explains to them this God that they are serving, he explains to them that this very God who does not inhabit temples but a spirit God, this very God is the God that determined the times set for them 
and the exact places where the, they should live. In other words, this God is orchestrating history. This God is involved in this story that is unfolding. He has been involved in setting them into place as people, as a nation, as individuals, where they should live, how they should live. And he has been doing this so that, listen, God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. As we began to look in the city of Chicago what, and see what God would have us to do, we began to realize that we didn't have a master plan, that Chicago was way too big, that we felt way too insignificant, that we had didn't have the resources, didn't have the manpower, didn't have the leadership, and that this task seemed insurmountable. So we did really what you do when you're desperate, we prayed. We prayed a lot. And our prayer was, God help us figure out what you want us to do. And so we began to develop a philosophy that was very simple. Pray, look, and cooperate. Pray, look, and cooperate. We pray, we look to see what, God, what you're doing, God, and then we jump in and cooperate with what you've already begun and what you've already begun to do. It was about 10 years ago that the entire church, we felt like it was a time to devote to some fasting and prayer, and so we challenged the entire church to uh, fast and pray for 40 days, and so there were, uh, or at least a portion of those 40 days, however they could, and probably about 50 people in the church decided to fast all 40 days. It was a juice fast, and so they fasted 40 days. And the whole idea behind it was, God, we're crying out for our city. We're asking you to open doors in the city to show us ways of reaching this people. God, you need to do a work in this big city of ours, the city of Chicago. And it was an incredible experience for some. Uh, we, we, we had all of the pastoral team fasted for 40 days. And there was one guy in the pastoral team that just, he didn't seem to be struggling with the fast a lot. We're like, hey, everybody else is losing a lot of weight and looks like um, they just got out of a concentration camp about the 30 days into it. But this guy, he was having no problem. And so we got to talking about the juicing that we did because we allowed juice and water. And he said, oh, I'm not I'm struggling at all. Found out he was blending, not juicing. He was putting bananas, milk, cornflakes in there, <laughs> stuffing it all. As long as he could drink it, he was doing. <laughs> Since we were fasting and we were spiritual, we kind of forgave him and let him go. But, <laughs> but God began to put... put Put it on our heart, and it was as a result of that season of fasting and prayer that God gave us really a bigger vision for the entire city. For the entire city. I prayed at the end of that season of fasting and prayer, went to the hotel room by myself, got my Bible, and I prayed a prayer that I felt like God had led me to pray. Have you ever prayed a prayer and felt like, hey, this was God that led me to pray this prayer? Not my own prayer, but God led me to prayer this. And have you ever prayed a prayer and wanted to take it back? Because I was in that hotel room alone, and I said, oh, God, give us 1% of the city of Chicago, 1% of the city of Chicago. And then I got my calculator out, <laughs> and I realized I had just prayed for 30,000 people because Chicago city proper is 3 million, and 1% is 30,000. And I kind of said, God, can I take that prayer back? I'm not sure I have my faith is that big. But I, I felt like God had led us to pray that prayer. So I went to the pastoral team and I began to ask, what would it, what would it be like to reach 30,000 people in the city of Chicago? What, that, what would that look like? What would it feel like? What would, it, what would this uh, be like? And we started to talk, well, uh, it would not be all in one big building. That would be too hard. We would have to be in a lot of different places. There's a lot of different languages here. We'd have to be really good at evangelism. We'd have to be really focused at raising leaders. This would have to feel more like a movement. And the more we talked about it, the more I thought, hey, that sounds a lot like the book of Acts. 
And it was as a result of a season of fasting and prayer that our eyes and spiritual ears were open to believe God for more. And if it weren't for that season of fasting and prayer, we would have been at one location in one neighborhood focused there, but God expanded our vision because we fasted and prayer, prayed and gave us a, a desire and a vision and a passion for more of Chicago. And then we went about saying, okay, God, how's this going to happen? Because we don't have a master plan. But you see, when you understand that God is already at work, that God is already working, and that it's really his work and not ours, that God begins to open the doors in some spectacular, supernatural ways. And one of the stories of how we got to the north side of Chicago involves three, people, three different people praying. I was taking my daughter up to the north side because I wanted her to learn Spanish and there was a school up there and as I walked around that community, I started feeling burdened for that community and I'd prayer walk around that area and I'd say, God, this area really needs you. I wonder if you are leading us to come up here and I brought a few people up there and they said, we don't even know anybody up here. It's way too far. We're way too busy. Little did I know that down the street, there was a 70-year-old man by the name of Chuck McWhorter that had been in a church for 50 years. And the church had, he had come to Christ as a teenager in that church. And that church at one time was a mega church in their city, uh, in the city. And it had dwindled and dwindled and dwindled down to a few people that were holding it together. And they were desperate and didn't know what to do. And were saying, God, help us. We're, we're going to have to close this building. And we're going to have to just sell the facility. Oh, they were crying out to God. God, give us a direction. I'm praying for the city over there. And I didn't know it, but we had started a home group up near that area. Some young people from our church, some singles from our church had started a home group, and they were meeting up in that area, and they were also praying for that area. In fact, they were desperate asking God for a building in that area, laying hands on building, praying, asking that God would open doors. Now, I didn't know they were doing that, and I didn't know Chuck was praying, and Chuck didn't know I was praying, but we were all praying for the same answer to prayer, even though we didn't know we were praying in the same vein. Why? Because God is at work, and God has a plan, and God has a story, and God has a narrative that he is preparing, a narrative that we cannot control, but we discover and understand what God is doing when we are sensitive and praying and seeking God, not doing our thing, but saying, God, what are you doing? How can we cooperate? And how can we give glory to your son, Jesus Christ? And through a series of circumstances, this group called me up to speak there. I realized that they were praying for the same thing I was praying for. About a month later, this guy Chuck called me up and said, hi, my name is Chuck. I hear, I hear what you guys are doing. Within six months, we had started a location at that place that was dwindling, dying, and we had to go to a couple services there, people coming to Christ. Why? Because God has a plan and a story. And the other thing that we discovered from this is that the cities are full of older churches like this that are historic, that have done incredible things in the past. But many of them have dwindled down to a handful of people and don't know really what to do. And what we discovered through this process, I discovered the power of honoring history. Because this was a church that was 110 years old, and it was basically given to us with nine pianos. Nine pianos? And when we first went in there, since we brought a bunch of young people, the, the thought could have been to sort of dismiss the past as, see, these people couldn't make it, but here we are with our new stuff and our loud music and our new way of doing things, and we really know how to do that. But God really convicted us about the fact that, you know what, I've been working in this city a long time, and so we determined that we would study the history of this church and honor the people that had been there. And every year, once a year, we do a ceremony in which we honor the history. We talk about what God did for 100 and, 110 years. Years, and we've adopted that history and we've made that our history. 
And that's happened several times. In fact, that's happened six times where people have given us their buildings. In fact, the Lincoln Park building where I'm at every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock, I started studying their history. This was 125 years old, and God really convicted me. Study the history. Learn the history. I've been at work. Don't dismiss what I've done before you. Build on the shoulders what I, of what I've done before. Uh, learn to identify my work uh, that I've been involved in for a long time because I'm the God of the big story. I'm the God of the narrative. And I started looking at the story of Lincoln Park, 125 years old. When they gave the building to us, there were 12 people in that place. And as I started start studying the story, I realized that in the early 1890-something, uh, R.A. Torrey preached in that building. Studied some more, realized that in August of 1892, C.I. Schofield preached in that building. C.I. Schofield was one of the mentors of Lewis Sperry Schaefer, who this chapel is named after. You see, there's a connection. God has been at work. And part of what we need to understand, whether you're going to India, whether you're going to Chicago, whether you're going to Paris, whether you're going to Madrid, wherever you're going, wherever God is calling you, part of the call that he has upon you is as you go to this city, as you go to your place of calling, you need to understand that God has been working there already, that God has a story that he's been writing already, that he has orchestrated the places and the times where people should live, and that he is building, and that his presence has been there, and that you search for what God has been doing, and then you begin to cooperate with, God, with the story that God has already started. One of the things that we teach our, our pastors all the time is to pray for whatever God is doing in our city. And periodically at a staff meeting, we'll all stop and, and, and I'll say, let's pray for every pastor that we know in this city, even the pastors that don't like us. And we'll pray for them. Because we understand and we're beginning to understand that we're part of a bigger story. And that we're part of a story that God is doing and that we are not the kingdom. God is the king and has a big kingdom and God is working in a lot of venues and God is working a lot of things and we are part of what he's doing. We're one piece of the puzzle of what he's doing, but his story is much bigger than us. And ultimately, that story always leads to the same conclusion. Listen, verse 27, he says, God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. Because ultimately, ultimately, every story leads to the God, the God story leads to the cross. It leads to redemption. It leads to Jesus. And as God is, right now, you don't know what's around the story that God is writing for you, but the great thing is that God already has this story in place. And you can't determine what that story is going to be, but you can determine in your life right now that I'm going to live my life in such a way that I'm sensitive to what God is doing, that I pray, I look, and I cooperate. Every major, decision, every major decision in your life and most of the major evangelistic movements in the New Testament were first of all preceded by times of prayer where people were seeking God and saying, God, what are you doing and how can we cooperate? The first missionary movement in Antioch, they were praying and fasting and it was God who sent them out as they were saying, God, we don't know the story, but we are putting ourselves in a place of sensitivity to you, and we are saying, God, here we are. We are looking for your divine signs and connection for what you're doing, sensitizing our heart. We're looking at where you've called us, and then we're cooperating with your plan and your perspective that leads to the cross and the redemption of Jesus. And what I'd like to do this morning, some of you are, have wrestled with your call and there's 
unfinished business we talked about, that's the first thing I think you need to focus on. I think the second thing is you're pursuing a mission with God. You need to not give God your plans and say, God, here are my plans. Now, will you bless them? I think it would be a better perspective to begin to say, God, let me pray. Let me look. Let me hear your voice. And then let me cooperate with what you're already doing. And that takes a degree of dependence on God. It takes a degree of humility. It takes a degree of us uh, figuring out and saying we don't have all the answers. I've never, we've never planted one of our locations based on a demographic study ever. We've never done that. We haven't said, where, is it, where, is, where are people moving to? Where are people growing the most? We've never done that. We've done it this way. God, where are you working? Is there signs of God activity over there because people are coming to Christ or someone gives us a building or there's a burden? Where are you working? I'm not against demographic studies, but I'm simply saying oftentimes we can depend on the tools of man as opposed to depending on the, uh, on, on the leading of the Holy Spirit to really lead us and guide us to some to where he wants us and what he wants us to do. And every location that we started has been that way, has been what are you doing, God? How are you working? And we would not have chosen some of the neighborhoods that we are in. We are in some rough neighborhoods. We would have not have chosen those. There's not a bunch of church planters there. But God has led us there. We believe by the Spirit of God in part because he opened up the door because we were simply saying, God, let's pray, let's look, and let's cooperate. I'm going to ask you to stand with me this morning. Some of you are at a place in your journey in which you have a sense of the call of God upon your life, a sense of where you may be going, but there's a a, a real open question in terms of what that's going to look like and exactly where you're going to fit in and what ministry it's going to be. And I want to just assure you today, I just want to assure you that God has a place and God has a plan. And that more than you figuring it out in advance, part of what God is calling you to do is have a heart that's sensitive to him. Keep your heart clean. Begin to Pray and look to God to say, God, not my plans, not what may seem logical or common, not what may uh, be climbing the ladder of the American dream of success, even in ministry, but God, here I am asking this question, Lord, would you give me divine appointments? Would you open the door? Would you uh, show me, because you have a story that you're writing, would you begin to speak to my spirit? Would I be sensitive to that? And God, let me look for those signs. Let me look for those divine connections, Father. Let my heart be clean before you, Lord. And then when it's clear, Lord, may I be willing to cooperate, even to go to the places that I would never have chosen or do the things that I would never have chosen to do, Father, because my life belongs to you and I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but yet it's not I, it's Christ that lives in me and I choose the crucified life. I choose to live under submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, under uh, obedience to to the leading and prompting of the Holy Spirit with the passion of the gospel inside of me, paying whatever the cost may be because this is not about my story. This is about God's story. And I pray that, Father, for every man and woman in this auditorium, Lord, that you would lead us, that you would guide us, that you would give us that heart. And I ask this in Jesus' name, amen.